This is a, a summer school on reasoning, but uh, the interesting parts of reasoning to me are usually uh, grounded, so I want to reflect a little bit what knowledge is. So a lot of times when we talk about knowledge, we think of something like this. It's simple declarative knowledge, what are capitals of all of the states in the US. Uh, it might be represented as a list or as a map or something like that. But there are other kinds of knowledge that are at least as important. Uh, so imagine that I was holding a hammer in my hand instead of a, a clicker, and I, I threw it. You can imagine the trajectory it's going to follow and the way that it's going to flip through the air on its way to wherever it is. You can imagine what's going to happen to that glass booth when, it, uh, when the hammer hits it. Um, and there's some uh, implicit or explicit, probably implicit, uh, knowledge about hammers and physics and uh, these kinds of things that is required to, to imagine that. Uh, another example is uh, more abstract knowledge, the kind of knowledge that we use to explain somebody's actions, knowledge that uh, relates, for instance, beliefs and desires to the actions that somebody takes. So when you start thinking about knowledge, you have to answer a couple of questions. Um, what is it that you know about the world? Things like uh, declarative knowledge, things like uh, these uh, uh, more simulation-y or abstract kinds of knowledge. Um, that's only useful because you can use knowledge for thinking. So the, the second question you always have to ask is, how is knowledge used for thinking, reasoning, and, uh, and drawing conclusions? Um, and finally, where does knowledge come from in the first place? Um, I'm going to try to say something uh, about my view of these first two uh, questions today, and I'm not going to say much about where knowledge comes from, although I'd be happy to talk about that uh, as well. Okay, so say we want to capture the kind of rich knowledge that people have of the world. Where are we going to look for uh, the, the kind of uh, tools for representation? Um, there are a lot of places to start. Uh, I'm going to start with what, something that's kind of atypical as a, a cognitive science representation of knowledge. But it is, in fact, probably the most successful representation of knowledge that humans have come up with, formal representation, which is computer programs. So computer programs are an amazing way of representing a certain kind of knowledge, knowledge of what to do. Um, and they're amazing because they're, they're completely explicit. They're a total formal representation. But they have these means of abstraction that let you capture uh, a very parsimoniously um, abstract knowledge about how to do things. So just as a, a kind of uh, very simple toy example, if you uh, uh, want to know how to add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, you might write a computer program that looks like that. It says, OK, add those up, maybe in that order. But then you can generalize that, and you can write a function that takes in three numbers, a, P, a B, C, D, uh, and returns their sum and apply that function sum to one, two, three, four. And now all of a sudden you've abstracted out adding those particular four numbers into knowledge of how to add four numbers together. We could abstract again and we could say represent a function that takes in a list of numbers of arbitrary length and recursively defines how to form the sum of those numbers by basically just saying if you're at the end then return zero and otherwise add the next number into the result of the rest, sum of the rest of the numbers. Now, boom, we have this abstract knowledge about how to add up numbers of arbitrary numbers, uh, arbitrary numbers of uh, arbitrary length. OK, so this turns out to be a universal way of representing knowledge of how to do things deterministically. Right? This is the, the, the Church-Turing thesis that uh, a programming language, I haven't really specified it for you, but a programming language is universal for representing how to do things. What a programming language can't give you is uh, what uh, I'm going to claim is a really maybe the key property of human knowledge, which is that it represents and embraces uncertainty. Now, I have to clarify uncertainty a little bit. There's one kind of uncertainty which is uh, really pretty obvious and comes to people's minds, which is noise. So here's, uh, you imagine you're, you're driving a car down the highway, um, and there's uh, a lot of rain, and so there's noise corrupting your visual input, and you can't quite see what the sign says. And the remarkable thing about people is they deal nicely with that kind of noise. We don't explode and drive off the highway. We, we, we do something reasonable, even though we don't have all of the information. Uncertainty for, for human cognition also, uh, also comes from uh, what turns out to be a much more important source which is lack of information. 
So imagine this scenario. You call your best friend on the phone, and he immediately screams at you and hangs up the phone. So you're left wondering, why did he do that? And you have different ideas. Maybe he wanted to hurt you. Maybe he thought you were a telemarketer who was calling to sell him something. So this is an example, and this is based on, uh, again, this, this kind of knowledge that actions are driven by beliefs and desires in, in some way. Um, and so this is an example of an under-constrained inference. You don't have enough information from your friend's action to figure out the latent things that you want to, his beliefs, his desires, his emotions. And so you have to deal somehow with that lack of uncertainty, uh, that lack of certainty. Um, finally, you might imagine something like the hammer scenario, where you have a lot of uncertainty about exactly where the hammer's going to go, maybe where it starts, how it's going to travel through the air. And so you'll have to, uh, we have to capture some notion of these, this uncertainty over aspects of the, I don't know whether it's the knowledge or the simulation, but uh, this kind of uncertainty. OK, so what are we going to do? Well, in order to, to, to start with programs, which are this very nice representation, and end up with something that can represent uh, uncertainty, uh, there's a very simple trick, it turns out. We're going to simply add random primitive programming language. The, the underlying programming language here is just JavaScript, which I'm using these days because people are happy with it. I used to use Lisp, but people are afraid of parentheses. So, um, so we say to ourselves, what if we, what if we take JavaScript and we, we just add a random primitive that flips a coin uh, with some with probability 0.3 in this case. So if we run this little snippet of a program, it's going to flip a coin and get, uh, let's say, heads or one. That's A, and then B, we might get zero. C, we might get one. And then we add those together, and in this case, we'll get two. The important thing about this is if we did it again, we might get a different answer. Maybe we do it again and we get zero. We do it again and we get one. And now imagine just doing this over and over and over and making a histogram of the results. You're going to get something like this. Now, what you have on the right is, in fact, a probability distribution. It's, if you do some math, it's that probability distribution, a distribution over the return values from this program. Um, the thing on the left is a specification of, of how to sample or simulate this distribution. Um, it's nice because uh, it's written down with the tools of a programming language, uh, which makes it easy to build bigger and more abstract chunks, the same way programming languages let you specify at more abstract knowledge. Critically, it turns out that the sampling semantics and uh, standard distribution semantics, those are equivalent. Uh, there's a theorem here that I won't go into, but it basically says any computable probability distribution that you can write down in the normal tools, you can also write down as an expression in uh, a random, uh, well, Lambda calculus augmented with random variables. OK, so that's great. Um, and now we can start to think about representing knowledge using these, these, uh, these probabilistic programs. You can think about this now as knowledge not of how to do something, but how something might have happened or might have been done. So how might you get different answers to this little program? Now, in probabilities, we're really just interested in representing a probabilistic model or probabilistic knowledge. We want to represent it, and then we want to reason with it. So we add another uh, little primitive language, which I'm here called. And what infer does is it takes a function that specifies a model, the ABC model uh, that I said before, and the return value that we're interested. We're still interested in what's A plus B plus C. But now we might have an additional statement like this one that says, uh, condition on A plus B being equal to 1. In other words, this is a hypothetical. We say, look, you're going to run this program, but you uh, want to enforce the assumption that A plus B is equal to 1, and then tell me what A plus B plus C is. So you can think about uh, what is, uh, you do the same simulation that you were doing before, uh, computing the condition as well as the return value. And if you ever find out that the condition is false, you just cross out that sample and pretend it never happened. And then you keep going. Cross out the ones that violate your condition, uh, keep the ones that don't, and make a histogram of the ones that you kept. So this, is, this induces then another distribution, which is called the conditional distribution. Um, and you can think of this as uh, uh, the definition of uh, conditional or hypothetical reasoning uh, in probability. Um, when I first made these slides, this sounded familiar to me, and I tracked down what I was thinking of, which was this Sherlock Holmes quote. It's an old maxim of mine that when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. 
the only addition I have to make there is, and then you add up all the true things and make a histogram. <laughs> um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with, with probability calculus and Bayesian reasoning, that, that was it. I just gave you a primer on everything you need to know about probability and, and Bayesian reasoning. You, you make procedures that make random choices in order to simulate possible outcomes. You uh, enforce conditions or hypothetical assumptions, and then you cross out the things that violate those conditions, make a histogram of what's left. That's probabilistic reasoning. Um, the nice thing about it is that it's a formal specification of what you should do with uncertainty, how you should reason given the uncertainty you have and how the, the program might have run. Okay. So probabilistic programs, in my way of thinking, a representation of uncertain knowledge, not how to do something, but a representation that we might have of what I think that the world does. I think maybe the world flips a coin three times and, and I see the result, for instance. Um, it's also a way of describing uh, inference or thinking using this knowledge. That's the infer function where you cross out the, the things that violate your assumptions. Um, one important thing that I hear there might be uh, many different ways to implement this infer function, not just the one where you, uh, you literally take samples and cross them out. That one's called rejection sampling. It's nice and very simple to think about, but there are equivalent ways to implement it that can be more efficient. That's the computer science way of saying this. There are equivalent implementations that vary in efficiency. The cognitive science way of saying this is that this is a computational level theory in the sense of uh, David Marr. So this is trying to specify uh, what people are doing. So what's the knowledge and what are the inferences that people uh, can draw, not how they do it, not the process. Um, so keep that in mind as I go along. This is uh, intended to allow us to specify knowledge and inferences, get predictions for behavior and compare them leaving open a lot of important questions about the, the details of the psychological process. Okay, so this isn't actually a talk about probabilistic approaches, uh, human cognition. Um, if you're interested in the programming languages themselves, you can check out the Web People Project, Web Probabilistic Programming Language, um, at webpeople.org, which I didn't put on there, but webpeople.org. Oh wait, that's the next thing, right, webpeople.org. Um, and if you go there, you should be able to run it in your browser and uh, you can play around with a couple of examples that are there. Okay, so how are we going to use this for uh, representing anything about human cognition? Well, I want to I kind of get into this from uh, an example. And it's an example that's going to look uh, kind of naive on purpose. So think about it. Does everybody know what tug of war is? Yeah. Good. So tug of war is a really nice example of a simple domain that people have a fairly rich knowledge of and can reason about really fluidly, really easily. And when you start introspecting about tug of war, there, there are some, some concepts that you might start naming that are kind of central to thinking about tug of war. By the way, here tug of war is sort of a stand in for these uh, team games in general. Um, but think of tug of war. So you might think about the, the relative strength of uh, the different people. So you've got strength. You might think that some people don't always use all of their strength or skill on a given, given game because maybe they're a little lazy. Um, in tug of war, uh, strength only matters because there's some amount of actual pulling that a person does on the rope. Um, in tug of war, we have teams. And the reason that this is a, a game is because uh, one of the teams is going to win. There's a winner. OK, so now I'm going to go and I'm going to write down a very simple definition of each of these concepts using, using web people, using this probabilistic programming language. And I'm just going to aim to write down, in some sense, the simplest one that I can come up with. So I say, OK, what's strength? Well, strength is a function that takes a person and returns their strength, which is a Gaussian uh, so a real number distributed according to a normal Gaussian distribution. Um, this is not important for this talk, but MEM just says that the strength is persistent across all time. It doesn't vary from match to match. Um, OK, what about laziness? Well, let's just say that laziness is also a function that goes from people and it returns a random uh, value whether or not the person is lazy on a given match. So it flips the coin to decide whether they're lazy. Uh, pulling, well, let's say that 
you take the person and you say, let's see if the person is lazy. If they are, then they pull with half of their strength, and otherwise they pull with their whole strength. Okay? Very simple representation of what the effect of laziness is supposed to be on how, how much pulling you do. Oh, and I'll say at this point, it looks like there's these, these uh, four parameters here. It turns out that uh, only, there's only one free parameter in this uh, because the, the mean and variance of, of the Gaussian, the people's strength, is just relative to other people's strength. Um, and that trades off against the, um, the divided by two there. Uh, so there's effectively one free parameter. It doesn't matter. OK, what about the total pulling? Total pulling of a team, well, I'm just going to say you use this map function, which takes the pulling function and applies it to every member of the team. And then you sum up how hard they're pulling. So it's the sum of how hard each person on the team is pulling. And what about the, the, the winner? Well, let's make this function that I'm going to call beat as a verb. So team one beats team two. And we'll just say that the team that's pulling harder wins. So you look up the total pulling of team one and the total pulling of team two. And if total pulling of team one is bigger, then team one wins. Okay. This seems really, really simple. The reason that this is already a kind of interesting and powerful representation is that I have now this set of stochastic functions that capture something about my knowledge about tug of war, and I can combine them together in different ways to express different situations, exactly the way that you compose functions to build bigger functions. So for instance, I could, do, I could make this medical inference. I could say, for what happens if we, if we assume that Bob and Mary beat Tom and Sue, and Bob and Bev beat Jane and Jim. And then I could ask a question like, so how strong is Bob? Now, let's just uh, keep you guys awake. So uh, first imagine to yourself how strong you think Bob is, given this evidence. Now imagine that instead the evidence was Bob and Mary beat Tom and Sue, and Bob and Mary, again, beat Jane and Jim. Uh, how many people, given the, the second set of evidence, does your estimate of Bob's strength go up? About down. Okay, down. People who said anything said down. And this is a pretty intuitive case. So, somehow you say, well, look, uh, if Bob and Mary were on the same team both times, maybe it was Mary who was strong and not Bob. And so I'm not so confident that Bob is, is strong from the second set of evidence. Um, OK, so uh, Toby Gerstenberg and I did a little experiment along these. We gave people uh, tournaments, uh, either singles or doubles. And for each tournament, we said which team won the match. And then we chose one of the players and asked, so how strong do you think this player is from very weak to very strong? Um, and here I'm showing you the, the mean empirical strengths from human data versus the model, the uh, predicted expected strength. Um, as you see, the correlation is about 0.99. Um, so we're capturing all of the variance in people's judgments about the, the strength of players given these uh, team games. So what I should have said we did. Um, 20 different situations, different tournaments. Um, so the takeaway from that is that somehow this simple set of, of stochastic functions, this simple little probabilistic program, is able, able to capture the important aspects of people's knowledge about these uh, team games in order to, uh, in order to predict um, strength of players. Um, after we first wrote down and played with this model, I found out something uh, that, that really pleased me, which was that there's a big, long, and complicated NIPS paper from uh, a while ago now where a bunch of Microsoft uh, research uh, people published uh, a new model of how to assign skill to players from game data uh, that they called true skill. Uh, and true skill is, is now actually what they've deployed for matching up players on the Xbox to make sure they have similar strength. And it turns out that true skill is a, is a special case of that naive model that I wrote down for you uh, a second ago. It's the naive uh, case where you only have singles tournaments. You don't have multiple players on a team. Um, so maybe there's something uh, interestingly right about, well, this model and true skill. Um, you can also do more interesting things. You can say, well, what about additional kinds of information? You know uh, this little dorky uh, uh, sportscaster tells you, that in game two, this player was lazy. Well, with respect to the probabilistic program, this is a real, right? We have compositional power of a programming language, so we just say, okay, Bob and Mary beat Tom and Sue, and hey, by the way, Bob was lazy, right? And then the system does an inference and, and returns some guesses about the, the strength of Bob. Um, we can compare that to the results of a 
experiment we did with people. And it turns out this was kind of interesting. People integrate the, the information from this, uh, this narrator. Uh, it affects their judgments, and it affects judgments in the way that the, the model predicts. OK, so that's pretty simple. Um, I want to I wanna kind of start getting more uh, complex and more interesting now. Um, I'm going to do it first with a, a, a little thought experiment about that will get us towards cognition. Um, so imagine that you have a friend, Bob, and uh, Bob has a favorite toy, which is a, a box, that box, that has two buttons and a light on it. And one day, uh, Bob brings in his favorite toy, and you see him playing with it, and he pushes the two buttons, and pushes the two buttons, yeah, pushes the two buttons, and the light comes on. The question for you all, how does the box work? It could be that one of the buttons alone makes the light go on. It could be that either of the buttons alone could make the light go on. It could be that you need both buttons to make the light go on, or it was totally spurious and there's no relation. So how many people think uh, A alone could make the light go on? B alone could make the light go on. A or B alone. Fraction. A and B? OK, and no relation. I, I love this thought experiment because it's incredibly reliable. In every audience I've ever done this in, there's uh, a, a minority, usually about a third of people, who say A or B. And uh, the majority are usually about two thirds who say A and B. Um, and when you ask people why, they say why, why they would choose uh, A and B, they say something about, well, why else would Bob have done that unless you, know, that you needed to press both buttons? So I want to see if we can capture that. First, let me just uh, say we did, we did a, a experimental lines. Um, the structure of each of the scenarios was just, look, just like Bob's box, but we used different materials. So you have a genetically engineered plant. Your co coworker pours a blue liquid and a yellow liquid on it. And then at the end of the day, the flowers are growing. And then we ask subjects, what causes the flowers to grow? Um, same five options. Um, we also have a control condition where we, we gimmick up some non-social uh, version of the middle paragraph, like a small earthquake knocks over a yellow liquid and a blue liquid, which pour on the flowers. Okay, and then same, same effect. Um, and the results of this are, are really nice. We had nine stories. Um, in the, the social condition, people uh, tend to favor the, the hypothesis that you need both of the causes in order to cause the effect. It's a conjunctive relationship, although there's a minority who say it could be either one. In the physical, oops, in the physical, on the other hand, that, that it, it reverses. So now people say, well, probably you, either one of those or one of those uh, could have done it. OK, so if we try to represent the knowledge and the reasoning that leads to this, um, if we just think, well, look, there's a structure. Bob took some actions. Uh, there's some true causal structure in the world, and that gives rise to the light lighting up. And say, OK, then we do inference and go backwards from the actions and the events to the causal. Uh, we might write this to give basically standard reasoning. Um, details, not super important, but this says, look, uh, the world causal structure, I don't know ahead of time, so I draw uniformly from possible structures of the world. Um, the action, I don't know where that comes from, so I draw an action randomly. I just say any action was possible. And the outcome comes from uh, seeing what that world causal structure predicts given the action. And then I condition on what I saw, pressing A and B, and the light goes on. And I say, OK, what's the world like? What's the causal structure? Now. The inference of a simple causal learning, causal reasoning model like this is pretty much flat. It says, look, I don't know because that was confounded evidence. It does what Karl Popper would have liked you to do. Right? It says, I can't draw a conclusion until you give me deconfounded evidence. This isn't what people do, though. So then we have to ask, OK, so what more do people bring to this situation in order to interpret that evidence? Um, and what we're going to add is some knowledge about the source of actions. We're going to try to capture the idea that uh, actions come from people making a decision based on their beliefs and their desires. And I'm going to help myself to the assumption that Bob actually knows how the box works because it's his favorite toy, blah, blah, blah. OK. And then we'll do inference. So how do we explain actions? Well, a represent what you might call the, the simplest rational decision making theory. It says, look, when somebody believes a certain structure of the world and has a particular goal, they go about choosing an action by saying, OK, imagine an action. See what outcome would come from that action. Assume that my goal is going to be satisfied in that outcome world. And then see what I did. 
right? So it's a hypothetical reasoning where you say, what must I have done if my goal was satisfied in the future? Okay. This is, it turns out, equivalent to the standard formulation of Bayesian decision theory, but I kind of like this, this hypothetical version. Um, so now we have a, a function called decide that takes a causal structure and a goal and will make a, a, a reasonable decision of what action to take. So we can take that and we can plug it back in the learning model. And the two changes we've made are right here. We've said, okay, actions are not unexplained things that come uniformly at random from the world. Actions come from making a decision. And that decision depends on a goal. Also secretly in there, but I didn't represent it, is the idea that uh, fewer actions are better. So uh, in big build-in, this action people prefer to take fewer rather than more actions. Um, and this model then, different. the results of this, that given that evidence, it's much more likely that you need both of the causes in order to cause the effect. And it's uh, basically for the reasoning that I hinted at. The, the model uh, needs an explanation for the actions the only reasonable explanation for the actions in this case is that Bob wanted the light to go on and he thought that you needed to put, push both of the buttons in order to make the light go on. Um, and then you infer that he probably has the correct knowledge about the box. Well, actually we built that in. Um, and so therefore the box probably requires both, uh, both causes. Okay, uh, so just to remind you, this is social plus this is the, the human data and the social condition. So they're a, a, a quite good match. Um, yeah. So why should, why should the model ever pick none? Oh, um, just because... Um, it's a uniform distribution. There's a the, yeah, so the, the prior over causal structures is uniform. So there's a, a, just a small chance that that was actually happenstance. Um, there's an interesting thing that it, it also is in play here, which is not unique at all to this, but um, we're treating events not as uh, something that happens at a certain point in time, but just as like, you know, did this event ever happen? So it's less of a coincidence if you just say, were the buttons ever pressed and did the light ever come on? Um, it would be much more of a coincidence if you got the exact temporal relationship, but you need something like a temporal event kind of model, actually, like you were just talking to me about. Um, yeah, but that's kind of unre unrelated to the point here. Um, okay, we did some more uh, versions of this control conditions that I'm going to skip. The point is that we're using this tool for representing the, uh, the, the, this tool of probabilistic programs for representing knowledge about how things unfold in the world and then inference uh, of making, drawing conclusions given assumptions. Now, uh, all of a sudden, in order to capture uh, this interesting uh, interaction between causal knowledge and learning about the world, and knowledge about social structure. How do people choose their actions? How do people behave? Um, so next I want to give you another example where we're going to go even further in this direction of social cognition, uh, scaling up to um, games where people about each other, cooperative games. So this is an example of a, a little uh, signaling game uh, basically borrowed from David Lewis. So imagine you're playing a game, and this is the, the common game board that both partners see, and one one partner is the speaker. They have to choose uh, whether to say blue or circle in order to convey the middle object. Now, how many of you are going to say blue? How many will say circle? OK. <coughs> You're mostly awake. That's good. Uh, the more interesting uh, uh, task in this game is the listener. So imagine somebody uses the word blue, and you have to guess which is the object. Now, how many of you are going to say this one in the middle? And how many are going to say the one on the side? OK. It's, a, it's pretty easy when I do it in that order. Um, so the reasoning here is something like, well, if the speaker had wanted to talk about the one in the middle, they would have said circle, right? So they must have meant the one on the side, even though both of those things are blue. So how do we capture that kind of reasoning? I'll show you an experiment in a second. But first, I want to just sort of show you uh, a little of uh, this. And the model looks very similar in some sense to Bob's box. So first, we're going to start out with the literal listener who actually doesn't think at all about what the, the partner's doing. The literal listener just says, look, I heard some property, blue or circle. I imagine an object from some prior over the, the objects in the context. And then I, I, I condition, I assume that that object actually has the property I heard. Right? So the effect here is if I heard blue, I cross out the red one, and I return either of the other two equally often. So. Um, so you know that that does some kind of inference, but it doesn't strengthen the inference uh, to the, the the square 
So we're going to need to go a little bit farther. The first thing we're going to do, the next step is going to imagine a speaker. We're going to imagine a speaker who thinks about this literal listener. So the speaker says to themselves, I have to come up with a property to say. And the assumption I'm going to make is that if the literal listener heard that property and made a guess, sampled from their distribution, they would be the object that I'm interested in. So then I say to myself, OK, what property do I need to say such that the literal listener will guess the right object? Um, in this case, the uh, speaker is a little bit more likely to say, actually about twice as likely to say blue uh, rather than, uh, rather than uh, well, yeah, sorry. If they're trying to talk about the object on the left, they're equally likely to say blue and square. Um, if they're trying to talk about the object in the middle, they're vastly more likely to say circle than blue. Okay. Okay. And then we can talk about a, a, a listener who knows that about the speaker, right? So now the sophisticated listener does the same kind of thing where they say, huh, what's the object, assuming that if the speaker were trying to convey, oops, I should say object, not world, were trying to convey that object, they would have said the utterance that I heard, right? So this is, each of these, uh, these functions specifies a really simple agent model. What's interesting about this is that they, they refer to each other. So the pragmatic listener reasons by thinking about what the speaker would have said, and the speaker reasons by thinking about how the literal listener would have interpreted different utterances. Um, and now it turns out that the pragmatic listener can strengthen the inference and say, oh, it's probably the one on the left, the square, because if it had been the circle, they would have said circle. Okay. Um, there's only one thing that we need just to be now a full model. Um, there are no parameters, but we do need to put in uh, some distribution over the objects in the context. Think of this as what are people likely to talk about a priori. Um, so Mike Frank and I did an experiment along these. Um, we had three objects with two binary features. We asked the speaker to choose which feature to use to talk about the object. Uh, we asked the listener to interpret an utterance, say which object was referred to, and we had a third condition where uh, we didn't, we, it was like the listener condition, but we didn't give them the word. We said, imagine somebody's talking about one of these objects and you don't catch the word. Which one is it? So we're going to use that as a direct measure of this prior over objects, the what are people likely to talk about. Okay, so basically what we do is we take the data from this prior condition and we plug it into the model and that gives us predictions for the listener and the speaker. Um, and it turns out that the data, the model predictions quite well. Um, it's nice, uh, this data is very graded, so it's not like people are just, uh, you know, looking at it and drawing a single deterministic conclusion. Uh, people, you know, assign uh, different, different weights to different options, uh, and the model predicts that gradedness. So, you can think of uh, this as either an example of sort of, uh, you know, kind of games and so, so this is an example of, of human cognition which is of the interesting social cognition sort that we're reasoning about each other. I'm reasoning about you, reasoning about me. Um, you can think about it as a game. Um, Mike and I like to think of it as a, a kind of simple proto-model of language understanding. Um, and in uh, a lot of work since we did that, we've extended this to cases of language understanding. Um, so the, the overall um, the overall structure of a model language understanding that's motivated by this, um, it, it actually looks very similar to the, the, the model of that, that shapes game. Um, I'll just sort of very briefly sort of point out what it's doing. So at the top we have a pragmatic listener again, and the pragmatic listener is trying to guess what the world is like given what the, the speaker says. So they have to think about the speaker, and their assumption is that the speaker would have said that utterance given the world. The speaker uh, has to think about uh, a listener and thinks about a literal listener under the assumption that the literal listener would guess the correct world. Um, and the literal listener says, OK, what's the world like? And now this uh, grounds out the kind of social recursion by saying, look, there's some conventional meaning associated to, these, uh, to this utterance. That gives us a function that maps from utterances and worlds to true or false. The, the standard truth functional denotation in, in uh, linguistic semantics. Um, and so the literal listener just says, let's assume that the literal meaning of this sentence is true. Update be beliefs uh, under that assumption to say, OK, what's the world like? Right? Um, and then uh, that literal listener sort of does a very, a very simple thing. Well, I should say, like, there's, 
most of what people usually study when they study language, phonology, phonetics, syntax, semantics, that's all stuck into that meaning function, so maybe it's not that simple. Um, but anyhow, at the end of the day, you get out a function that lets you evaluate an utterance in a given world and say yes or no. Um, and then all of the magic happens from this stack of social cognition of the speaker trying to be informative, trying to convey a given world to that literal listener, and the pragmatic reasoner having a model of the speaker behaving like that and using it to say, okay, so what must the world be like if the speaker chose this particular utterance? Um, uh, we've uh, ended up calling this, possibly a bad choice, but we've ended up calling this the Rational Speech Act Framework. Uh, and you can take a look at some papers that Mike and I wrote um, and also just go to my webpage. There's at this point about 30 papers on this framework. Um, so one thing that you kiss is kind of standard linguistic examples of what pragmatics is supposed to do for you. So uh, for instance, the, if Gregor Mendel there says some of the apples are red, uh, the inference that people will draw, the interpretation is that not all of the apples are red. So maybe uh, two of the three apples are red. Um, and uh, indeed, if you, if you uh, play around with the RSA model, you'll find that the interpretation of some apples are red uh, says that it's definitely more than zero. It could be one, it could be two, but it's probably not three. For exactly the same reasoning as we saw in the, the set of three shapes, right? Well, if it had been all three apples, the speaker could have said all and they didn't and so on. Um, I'm not going to go into scalar implicature because uh, I think it's like a dead horse that's been beat a lot. But um, actually, one of the examples, if you go to webpeople.org uh, and look at the little drop-down uh, menu of examples, one of the examples is the scalar implicature model. So you can go play with it to your heart's content. Um, I thought instead that I'd show you something more recent that I think is a lot more fun. Uh, so let's talk for uh, my last minutes about non-literal language understanding. So. An interesting thing about the people that, the, the way that people use language, um, and it's particularly, I think, interesting in light of the implied connection between language and logic that this sort of today and probably the whole summer school sort of builds up, is that people totally violate the literal meanings and the logic, the kind of literal logic of language in everyday conversation. So Shakespeare says, uh, what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. And that doesn't mean that Juliet is a large ball of burning gas, uh, you know, a few million miles away, which would be the literal meaning. It means something like uh, Juliet brings light to my life, or Juliet is, uh, is really hot, or something <laughs> metaphorical like that. Right? <clears throat> um, here's a, another example, which is going to be a little more amenable to at least the initial experiments. Here's a Yelp review. Need I mention that it took a million years to get the waiter to our table to order? So that literally means that it took, you know, 10 to the 6 years or something. It didn't, right? Instead, what's going on here is that people are, this, this reviewer is using language in a, a way that's false in order to convey a particular uh, intended meaning. In this case, some irritation with the, the, wait, the waiting. Okay, there's lots of examples of this kind of hyperbole. I told you a thousand times already. My phone is 100 years old. Uh, a latte at that hipster place costs $10. I leave that one in because when I first put it in, I thought it was hyperbole. And then I went and gave this talk in New York. And they were like, oh, no, that's totally reasonable. <laughs> so it shows the uh, context sensitivity of interpreting <laughs> hyperbole. So here's the puzzle. Um, understanding, in some sense, start in the meaning of the words and of the sentence, the literal meaning. Um, but language is used in ways that are often sort of completely divergent from that, literally false. Oh, and I mean literally, literally there, not figuratively, which is the way that it's often used now. Um, so uh, in other words, why is it that exaggeration and hyperbole and metaphor are not lying? Why are they cooperative, reasonable uses of language? So the RSA model, the, the, the language understanding model I just showed you, actually keeps this sort of non-literal language usage. Uh, but it turns out that all extension can. There are two ideas that Justine, how the Jean Wu and, and Leon and I uh, kind of uh, focused on when we were thinking about how to model hyperbole in particular. Um, the first is that, well, 
the interpretation of a lot of non-literal language, especially hyperbole, irony, uh, is often about the opinion or affect of the speaker beyond the, the actual state of the world. So maybe what we need to do is extend our notion of world to include those opinion dimensions. That's a, a first step. That turns out not to be enough on its own. There's another insight, which is that the speaker may have a goal uh, of only conveying the opinion and not really care about the, the literal truth, what's actually uh, the case in the world. Um, and so we're going to capture that by allowing the listener to reason about the speaker's goal, which is, uh, I like to talk about it as the topic of the conversation, although linguists call it usually the question under discussion, QUD. Okay, so what do we have to do to the model to, to capture those, those two things? Well, uh, we did this sort of in the wrong order. We extend the world so that what the world looks like here is uh, a uh, prior distribution over the actual value. So think of this as a, a, a well, the example I'm going to use is prices of things. So a sentence like, my, uh, my watch cost $100. So there's the actual value. And then there's another dimension, which is the affect of the speaker about the value. So my watch cost $100, and I'm angry about that, or I'm happy about that. Okay. Um, then uh, that captures the, the part of extending the state space to have the actual number and the opinion. Um, and then we need this topic thing. So we're going to say, look, uh, there are QUDs, the, the question under discussion, or the topic that the speaker is trying to convey. The listener has to reason about those, because they're not sure what the topic is, um, but they don't have very strong prior beliefs. There's just some uniform uh, over some set of QUDs. And now here the possible QUDs are the actual state, the affect, both the state and the affect, or some approximate version of each of those. What does the QUD do? Well, it's very simple. Um, the QUD is simply something that the speaker uses when evaluating whether their, hypo their, their assumption is satisfied, their condition. And they say, look, I don't actually care about the whole world. All I care about is the part of the world that, I, that my QUD picks out, right? So they imagine, what would the listener interpret the utterance as? They extract the QUD relevant piece, so the state or the affect or both, and they compare it to the QUD relevant part of the actual world. Right? So if, I, if I'm the speaker and I make an utterance that conveys the right thing about the QUD, I don't care if it conveys the wrong thing about something else in the world. Um, and it turns out that that's enough to drive this, this non-literal inference. Um, so let me, let me show you, well, okay, let me pause. It's enough to drive this non-literal inference, and the intuition here is something like the following. The literal listener uh, will draw the literal interpretation. The speaker knows that the literal listener is going to do that, but only evaluates uh, her utterances on the basis of how informative they are about the QUD. And so the pragmatic listener, if he hears an utterance whose literal interpretation is really unlikely, he starts to think, well, maybe that's because the QUD was some atypical QUD, like just conveying opinion, right? And then at that point, it makes sense because the speaker could have said that utterance if all they cared about was conveying the opinion. And that's a kind of sketch of what actually happens in the computation that gets run by this model. Okay, so we set out to evaluate this. Uh, we collected some about the prior, and so we took three kinds of things, uh, electric kettle and mm, laptops and watches, and we just asked people, okay, how expensive do you think those things are? Um, so this is, you know, how likely is it that it costs $1,000, 5000 and so on. Um, fortunately, they'll have different beliefs in category of items. So, you know, laptops are more expensive than watches. That's good. Um, I should have said, this is uh, prior, data, prior knowledge that we're eliciting to plug into the model again. This is not the, the data we're trying to predict, right? So we need to know how likely it is that different things cost different prices a priori. We also need to know how likely it is that somebody annoying that costs a certain price. So he asks, you know, if Eric bought an electric kettle that cost $10,000, how likely does he think it is that it was too expensive, right? So those give us priors over the state of the world and the affect that people are likely to feel in that, in that state of the world. There's affect that does whatever it does. And then we can uh, get the, the data that we're actually trying, which is how people interpret different prices. So, uh, Eric bought an electric kettle, a friend asked him was it expensive, and Eric says it costs $10,000. Uh, 
And then we uh, just ask people, okay, how likely is it that it actually cost these different prices? Right? So if people interpret it literally, they should say that it actually cost $10,000. They should you know, put this slider up to the top and all the others at the bottom. If people are interpreting this hyperbolically, then they should think it's kind of likely that the kettle actually cost some smaller amount, like $50 or $51. Um, so here is all of the data put together. So this is a scatter plot of uh, all of the utterances and all of the interpretation uh, actual prices. Um, and it's color coded to, to pull out the straw. First of all, you know, the correlation is good. We're able to uh, predict people's interpretation of the prices very nicely. Um, it's color coded to emphasize that um, this, is, this uh, ability to pre predict people's interpretations is true for the literal exact interpretations. Those are the blue ones. And, you know, they span a significant range. Um, it's also true for the orange ones, which are the hyperbolic ones, uh, which we classified as the ones where the interpreted price is much lower than the uttered price. Right? Um, and there's nothing in the model that, that ahead of time tells it hyperbolic or, or literal. It's an inference that happens based on this kind of reasoning about the, the speaker and the question under discussion. Um, let's see. I think... Um, now, let me just give you one piece of insight. If I just pull out the conditions from that giant scatter plot, um, this is uh, human interpretation of the electric kettle cost uh, $1,000. Um, and what you see is some nice structure here. So here's the literal interpretation, $1,000. Here's a uh, nearby what we call fuzzy interpretation, $1,001. Think, people think, oh, when you say $1,000, you might have meant 1001 And here's this set of hyperbolic interpretations that it actually cost $50 or $51. Um, so in the model, if we don't allow the model to reason about the, the goal or question under discussion, it just draws a literal interpretation, right? That's the kind of failure of a basic RSA model to do something useful. If we extend the model to allow it to reason about the question under discussion, um, then it exhibits some more interesting behavior. So if we allow the goal conveying the approximate price, then all of a sudden it gets this, uh, these nearby uh, values. That's called the pragmatic halo. A thousand might have meant a thousand and one. Um, if we add instead the goal of effect, so they could have been trying to convey their opinion or they could have been trying to convey the price, then we get this kind of mixture between uh, hyperbolic interpretations and the literal one. And then, of course, if we allow both of those goals, we get uh, a mixture that includes Lee and these fuzzy uh, interpretations that looks like the people. Okay, um, so that's what I uh, had to tell you about today. Um, I just want to spend a second summarizing the, the narrative arc of this, this talk. Um, at the very beginning, I said, what's, what's knowledge? What's knowledge like? Um, and I, I showed you some examples of knowledge that varied from very declarative to kind of more like implicit or simulation rich knowledge. Um, I then went to something that looks not all that rich at all. I said, oh, what about programs? They're nice. And what about probabilistic programs? And hey, look, we can add some numbers together. That looks like a very simple and kind of uh, sparse sort of representation of knowledge. But the important thing about it is that just like a programming language, out of these very simple components, you can build up abstract knowledge and abstract components that describe much richer situations. And so that's what I then tried to do in the rest of the talk. I said, hey, let's, let's try to naively sketch out tug of war. We write down some functions and then we apply them for reasoning. And hey, all of a sudden, the ability to take this small set of functions and compose them in different ways and then do probabilistic inference, it actually captures a lot of this kind of systematicity and gradedness that uh, is characteristic of human, human reasoning. Um, and then we didn't stop there. We said, well, let's take another example, which is usually thought of as like a, a rich paradigm and very hard case, social cognition. And it turns out that as long as you have a reasonable model of what would somebody do, this sort of uh, decision, rational decision-making component. You can build on top of that uh, these descriptions of these very rich situations like you know, the Bob's Box joint causal social reasoning or these, uh, these, um, these uh, reference games like the, the shapes. Um, and then with that, we can then extend it a little bit more and build a model of how we interpret language in context. And now, Usually when people talk about language, they think of it as a very special separate thing, right? The language facility is separate from reasoning and separate from other things. 
this sort of model gives you a different view. It says, look, the key thing about at least the, the pragmatic aspects of language interpretation are the model that you have of how somebody else is likely to behave, how somebody else is likely to choose an utterance. Um, and that's knowledge that's just like the knowledge that you needed for Bob's box or for, uh, for reasoning about tug of war. Um, and then sure enough, uh, it turns out that we can capture a, a huge array of aspects of context sensitive language understanding with that. And I showed you just the one example of hyperbole. Um, in other papers, uh, we've extended it to, well, that specific model we've extended to capture I verbal irony, uh, some aspects of metaphor. Um, we've used very related models to capture things like vagueness um, and anyhow, dot, dot, dot. If you're interested in the, the linguistic part of this, I can point you to some, uh, some review papers. Um, uh, let's see, if you're interested in uh, applying probabilistic uh, models and in particular probabilistic programs to human cognition, take a peek at probmods.org, which is the textbook I use for teaching my grad class that I wrote with Josh Tenenbaum. It's going to be updated at the end of the summer for next fall, but anyhow, it's there. Um, if you're interested in the probabilistic programming languages themselves and you're thinking, how would you possibly implement something like that, take a look at uh, DIPPL.org, uh, Design and Implementation of Probabilistic Programming Languages. Um, and thanks for listening, and thanks for funders, and all of that. <laughs>